Welcome to USSO's Eyes on the Fence. Good evening and welcome to this episode of Eyes on the Fence, the first in our American politics and policy mini-series. Through these interviews, we hope to inform American studies specialists about public bodies, NGOs and charities which have made an important contribution to Anglo-American understanding. We're also interested in cooperation between the academic, the political and the policy studies sectors and will, I hope, provide some useful advice on how to get involved with all of these various efforts. Today, to kickstart this series, I have a very esteemed guest. His name is John B. Bellinger III. John is an American lawyer who served as the legal advisor for the US Department of State and the National Security Council during the George W. Bush presidency. He is now an adjunct senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and partner and co-chair of global law and public policy at the law firm Arnold and Porter LLP. He is an expert and experienced commentator on American foreign policy, politics and law. He also holds the honourable role of being the first of our guests to be tweeted by former President Donald Trump after he represented Ambassador Bill Taylor during Mr Trump's impeachment proceedings. Today, however, we will be discussing John's role as Vice Chair of the American Digital Foundation, the US branch of a foundation established in 1958 at the height of the Cold War. Digitally was established to act as an educational centre for the study of Anglo-American relations by the conference method. Rooted in the stately manor of Ditchley Park near Sharbury in the Cotswold itself near Oxford, Ditchley was once a private home that sheltered Prime Minister Winston Churchill during World War II. Since 1962, however, it has an illustrious history of holding policy discussions at which select invitees spend two or three days, conventionally a weekend, discussing urgent policy questions. John, to introduce Ditchley's environment and ethos for those who have never visited Ditchley House, just what makes this setting and format quite so unique? And further to that, is there a particular anecdote from your extensive personal experience at Ditchley Park which really bespeaks the unique qualities of this environment and this setup? Well, Tom, uh, first, thanks very much for uh, for having me on. Um, I'm uh... I may be the first of your guests to have been uh, tweeted at by our former president, but he's tweeted at so many people that I'm sure I won't be the, the last, uh, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here to talk about uh, uh, the Ditchley Foundation, American Ditchley Foundation, which is a uh, uh, organizations that are really very dear to me. Um, as you note, uh, the Ditchley Foundation has been sponsoring for 60 years now foreign policy conferences at a beautiful historic estate, 17th century, um, uh, outside of Oxford. Uh, for us Americans, at least think Downton Abbey, and indeed some parts of Downton Abbey were actually uh, filmed there. Um, and for 60 years, it has held about uh, eight to 10 conferences uh, of uh, high-level, current, former government officials, academics, journalists, business people to talk about the uh, relevant uh, issues uh, of the day. Um, I've been participating in Ditchley conferences for about uh, 15 years now. I uh, started when I was still the legal advisor of the State Department and then have continued on and ultimately uh, joined the board of the uh, the American arm of Ditchley called the American Ditchley Foundation, uh, which supports the conferences uh, at Ditchley. So one, it's just a beautiful setting. It really is. Uh, uh, and the the setting is the uh, a backdrop for a really good in-depth uh, and candid conversation. As you mentioned, Tom, uh, it usually takes place over uh, two or three days. Uh, there are usually about 30 or 35 people uh, per conference at quite a high level. Uh, we start with uh, a plenary and usually a, a presentation of the theme. Um, uh, and then uh, we move into, and this is part of the magic of Ditchley, we move into uh, breakout sessions, a little bit like small seminars of uh, about eight to 10 people, where we go off into the different rooms of uh, uh, of the Ditchley House uh, 
for uh, three or four in-depth sessions in the small groups to bat around the particular subparts of whatever the big issue is. Uh, and then we come back at the end three days later to have uh, each of the groups a report on uh, their discussions to the plenary and then really subject those reports to some level of essentially cross-examination. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, at the end of it all, uh, and I've had to play this role and it's a bit scary, one of the participants has to have listened to all of this three days of discussions and try to summarize it all succinctly uh, into, uh, into some takeaways. But uh, you know, it brings together really some of the best uh, foreign policy minds, scholars, government officials to really look hard for three days at particular issues in a, in a very candid uh, setting where people can really share uh, their views, disagree uh, uh, strongly, and uh, everything is off the record uh, completely and really doesn't leak out. Uh, and of course, having it in a be beautiful setting like uh, the the Ditchley Park House is um, is a great place to have it. You asked um, about a particular conference. They're they're all enjoyable. Um, strangely, the the one that I may remember the most uh, is my very first one. Uh, uh, maybe because I was new to Ditchley, but it was in February two thousand and eight. Uh, I was still the legal advisor of the State Department. And it was the 50th anniversary uh, of Ditchley. It was there and it was called uh, The Priorities for U.S. Foreign Policy After George W. Bush. And it was chaired by former Prime Minister John Major. Uh, now, what was interesting about it is it was February 2008. So there's a whole nother year left of the Bush administration uh, but Ditchley was already beginning to talk about the priorities for U.S. foreign policy after George W. Bush. So the title alone tells you a little something that uh, people were looking forward to the end of the Bush administration. Uh, I, uh, I I was substituting for my then colleague, uh, Ambassador Nick Burns, who was the Undersecretary of State, uh, uh, later went on to be chairman of American Ditchley and is currently, as we speak today, Tom, as you know, the U.S. ambassador to China. Uh, but Nick at the last minute could not come and asked if I would go. I was a poor and pale substitute for, for Nick Burns. And there I was having to sort of uh, explain and defend that we still had a year left in the George W. Bush administration as everybody was sort of looking a, a year out about the U.S. foreign policy priorities a year later. Uh, but, um, you know, I remember valiantly trying to explain uh, U.S. foreign policy to uh, uh, 34 or so other people, uh, uh, many of whom were not great fans of the, the George W. Bush administration. But it was a, a very respectful uh, discussion uh, between uh, Brits, Americans and uh, in a smattering of other Europeans. And I thought really you know, quite emblematic uh, of what Ditchley does. And candidly, um, although in some ways it was a slightly edgy experience for me at the time, you know, if I hadn't liked it, I wouldn't have come back for another 15 years. So uh, it, it shows you the value of Ditchley in the uh, U.S. American, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, European dialogue. Thank you, John, for that answer. Another primary component of Ditchley's activities are its esteemed annual lectures. Since 1962, these have been held by many prominent Americans, including John F. Kerry, Stephen Breyer, the former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Strobe Talbot, the former Deputy Secretary of State, and prominent academics, including Michael Ignatieff and Joseph Nye. These started in 1962, when the economist and newspaper editor Harry Hodson declared in his opening annual lecture, that, quote, the importance of what will be done at Ditchley over the coming months and years lies in the fact that never was there a moment in history when a close and indestructible understanding between Britain and America was more vitally necessary, more desperately needed than it is today. No less a thing than the peace of the world may depend upon it, and even perhaps the survival of mankind. John, keeping that quotation in mind, could you offer us a brief history of why Anglo-American connections, relations, 
diplomacy were quite so important to Ditchley, Harry Hodson and the world during that period. Well, of course, I was not around at the time, so this is received <laughs> wisdom uh, uh, to both you and me, Tom. But we, um, you'll recall that in that period, that despite the closeness of uh, between the United States and Britain during World War II, um, you know, there were then an awful lot of tensions uh, in the uh, end of the 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s. And you know, it maybe reached the nadir in 1956 over Suez, uh, but then really continued on. Uh, uh, former Secretary of State uh, 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 Dean Acheson famously said in 1962 that uh, uh, Britain had lost an empire and had not found a role, which uh, I think really angered, understandably, uh, uh, the British government. Uh, uh, there was the cancellation of the Skybolt program, which was called the Skybolt crisis at the time, uh, and oh, a number of commentators at the time in the early 1960s said that the, the special relationship wasn't looking very special at all. Uh, so you know, that period of late 1950s, uh, early 1960s, uh, it was a, a awkward period between uh, U.S. and uh uh, and the UK. I don't know fully what was in uh, uh, David Wills's mind when he uh, first created the Ditchley uh, Foundation and donated uh, Ditchley Park, which he had bought back in 1953 to the foundation, and then a few years later created the lecture. Uh, but you know, he himself was um, uh, a big believer in the transatlantic alliance uh, and relationship. He had worked on the D-Day planning himself during World War II and, and firmly believed that the United States uh, uh, and Britain needed to work together to uh, solve these transatlantic problems. So you know, I think that was that was really sort of the history at the time. Of course, it was all of this against the backdrop of the Cold War. This was the height of the Cold War at the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s. Uh, and it was important for Americans, Europeans, and, and, and Brits in particular. This Ditchley started, I think, as a bit more of a uh, Anglo-American discussion group and has expanded over the years into transatlantic involving more Europeans and really in the last few years, uh, others from 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 Asia and and elsewhere, but that those were really the uh, I think the uh, original concerns that uh, uh, resulted in the creation of uh, of Ditchley in the early nineteen sixties. Fantastic, um, and that brings us on to the next component of the story, which is the foundation of the American Ditchley Foundation in nineteen sixty four. Shortly thereafter, the original uh, British Ditchley is what I might want to call it. Um, how has American Ditchley worked alongside both the British and Canadian Ditchley's a later creation um, to further Ditchley's mission in the United States, particularly? And have you encountered any particular difficulties, let's say, or dynamics in trying to bridge those two political systems and trying to create this model that spans both sides of the Atlantic, for example, during COVID-19, I'm thinking particularly? So again, I wasn't present at the creation, so to speak, of uh, American Ditchley uh, in the early 1960s. But American Ditchley is the, the booster arm in the United States for the Ditchley Foundation. Um, and we principally do three things. We, uh, we raise uh, some money for Ditchley. Uh, uh, perhaps most important, we recommend American participants because being Americans and being on our side of the pond, you know, we know the government officials, the former government officials, the scholars, the journalists better um, uh, on our side. So we can recommend people to be participants and go to the conferences. Um, and then we actually host uh, uh, generally, I don't know how long this has gone on, but one, one to two conferences a year uh, at a beautiful American estate called Green Tree, uh, which is uh, uh, outside New York City and, and rather coincidentally has uh, formerly been in the, the Whitney family. Uh, Jock Whitney had been actually ambassador to the court of St. James and he left his estate of 
several hundred acres here on our side of the pond to a sort of a similar foundation that's largely used by the UN. Uh, and once or twice a year, American Ditchley will host Ditchley conferences uh, at Green Tree. Uh, but we've had a, a strong board uh, over uh, many years. Uh, Strobe Talbot, who used to be the Deputy Secretary of State and was the president of the Brookings Institution, was uh, for many years the uh, chairman of American Ditchley, uh, succeeded, as I mentioned earlier, by Ambassador Nick Burns, uh, and now Jamie Missick, who's the former Deputy Director of the CIA, is our chair, and I am the I am the vice chair. Uh, as to sort of what's happened... Um, in the we we work pretty seamlessly with uh, the mothership uh uh now of course what happened to all of us during covid is that none of us could go over to uh, ditchley itself and 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 that is maybe candidly 80 80 90% of the magic is is the place and to be there uh and to go into the breakout sessions and to continue the breakout sessions as they spill out into the beautiful spaces and you can uh, talk over a meal or talk over a coffee or talk over uh, even a glass of port at the end of the evening or walk around the grounds. Uh, so uh, during COVID, Ditchley actually continued uh, virtually. We had virtual conferences uh, uh, with great uh, kudos for our uh, current director, uh, James Arroyo, who pre-COVID uh, had been pushing hard for uh, video technology uh, to allow people who did not have time to fly uh, to Ditchley. Uh, at the time the COVID hit, just coincidentally, that video technology was in place uh, with good bandwidth for being way out in the countryside. Uh, and uh, so Ditchley conferences for two and a half years were held virtually. Um, and so that was a, we didn't have quite the same uh, Ditchley magic, uh, but we continued to have the conferences and the and the good discussions, uh, you know, instead of uh, being able to go into a breakout room. Well, actually we did. We went into the, with the, the miracles of modern technology, stuff that I can't do. Uh, you know, people could push a button and send us off from the plenary of 35 people into little breakout rooms of seven and eight and, uh, uh, and uh, at the end of our allotted hour and a half, you would see the clock ticking down to say, you have 60 seconds before the breakout session ends. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was a bit of a challenge during COVID. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And that um, the ability to break out into Zoom, break out rooms, particularly at that moment, that all kind of alloyed a longer standing dynamic we've seen digitally in the kind of last 30 uh 30 years or so, which you mentioned um, earlier, the expansion of concern and the expansion of participants from Africa, Latin America, Asia, and to really globalize and work on that original Anglo-American ethos, but to expand it and to think about what the Anglo-American connection or the link, the articulation can mean as a pivot in a more complex, multipolar, post-Cold War world. Obviously, we speak with Prime Minister Sunak very recently in office. Therefore, I'd like to ask, what role not only do you see this Anglo-American relationship continuing to play in this multipolar world with all these challenges such as climate change, food crisis, and what is the role of institutions like Ditchley in continuing to balance those two priorities and continuing to try to catalyze the Anglo-American relationship to address more complex um, issues that need more international and multipolar responses? Well, to a certain extent, Ditchley provides an opportunity for you know, what we call you know, track two or track 1.5 dialogues for the people who don't know those terms. Uh, a track two dialogue are uh, uh, dialogues really between two countries, but not between the officials of the countries. They're often academics or former government officials who can talk uh, more candidly uh, a track 1.5 dialogue is uh, officials of one country and sort of scholars or uh, former government officials of another country. And you know, it can be particularly useful uh, between countries that have real tensions between them, where if you put the government officials together, all they do is just read their talking points at each other um, and no one budges one inch off their script and uh, they're not a lot of fun and don't make much progress. So obviously, 
you know, Brits and Americans and Americans and Europeans have for years had uh, candid discussions, but Ditchley allows even more candid discussions uh, where people really can um, uh, say what they think if, if you're either a, a former government official on the US or the UK or the European side uh, uh, or a scholar or a journalist. You know, you can really bore into these issues and, and people don't have to stick with their government positions. Uh, uh, if, if, if you're a former government official or a former British official or a former European official, you can just say, look, I, I agree with you completely. It's, this is a problem. Uh, but look, this is how we need to try to solve it. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it is now and it always has been uh, uh, at Ditchley a great opportunity to have these candid discussions. And, and Tom, as you say, what started long before my time is, I think, primarily uh, US, UK, then continental Europe uh, is now uh, global uh, with Russians, Chinese, Japanese, you know, obviously, certainly Australians, Canadians, others, but you know, uh, from Africa, from Latin America, uh, to bring in these uh, perspectives. And you know, it's very useful for us Americans. I mean, we know that the United States is admired around the world, but there are also a lot of things that people don't like about the United States, you know, whether it's being accused of hypocrisy or uh, uh, American values that uh, are you know, anathema elsewhere. You know, those are the sorts of things that can be people talk about, you know, behind closed doors at in, in New York or Geneva but at Ditchley, you know, you can just talk about it directly uh, and have really candid discussions about the issues of the day. So it's probably needed more than ever to be able to have these discussions. And it's also worth saying that the remit of topics under discussion has expanded. There's increased interest, for example, in AI, technology, Bitcoin, for example, a recent conference we have here on October 14th was called A Hungry World on the Move, which was about the impact of the food crisis on migration and how we must respond. So there's lots of forward thinking and thinking about the problems and the issues which are going to um, come up in the years ahead and prove most thought-provoking and challenging. And just to kind of move to structural issues as time is uh, running out, digitally recruits many people from academia to go to his conferences, as you referenced. What advice would you give to those pursuing a degree in American studies, politics, or history, the primary uh, components of our audience, or indeed those already in academic positions at universities or schools who may be looking to enter the policy field or simply learn more about these discussions which are going on in place, and who want to make their own contributions to these discussions, for example, at an institution like Ditchley? Well, I'll say two things. Um, uh, one, uh, try to figure out how to get an invitation to Ditchley because it's a wonderful place. Uh, and while it's true that most of the conferences are composed of senior people who are, you know, have already made it in, in government or academe or business, a few places are always reserved. Uh, and I think probably even more so now, but even when I began 15 years ago, a few places were always reserved for uh, students, uh, often students at Oxford. Sometimes they'd be uh, Rhodes Scholars from elsewhere who were at Oxford, but uh, you know, students who, who were already beginning to make a mark in a particular area. So it's always good to have uh, up and coming young scholars to be uh, to be part of a Ditchley conference. But, you know, more broadly, uh, of course, you know, there's a great history of, of academics going into government uh, and really making a significant mark. Not every academic is successful. The ivory tower does not always translate well uh, into government. But for many, it has worked out well. I know the American officials better than the British side, but, you know, you think about you know, people like Henry Kissinger, Madeleine Albright, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. You know, I worked for Condoleezza Rice for eight years in government. And of course, she had previously been a professor and provost at Stanford. And so these are people who you know, have been really substantive scholars and historians who have made a successful transition into government. So I guess I'll end simply by saying, you know, particularly at a time when our 
uh, democracy is under assault, uh, that uh, people in the United States and Britain elsewhere are questioning government, uh, questioning the value of central governments. You know, we need really good people to go into government. And uh, often those are scholars who have really spent uh, many years working on a particular substantive uh, issue and who can then come and bring uh, that historical experience or public policy experience uh, or experience studying government at some different time, bring that into government itself. So my uh, my plea is, uh, and I say this a lot when I go talk at American universities and law schools, is you know we need we need good people in government, and uh, it's uh, it's it's a time where your government needs you. Fantastic. <laughs> That is a message the whole of our audience will be incredibly excited to hear. And I'm sure for many people who would be interested in exploring these options, the Digitally Foundation is a perfect place to investigate and to start looking at how this works in action. So, John, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure and it's always fantastic to talk about Digitally and its mission. So thank you very much. Tom, thank you. Thanks for all you do for Digitally as well.